you know, waterfowl hunting has the word water in it for a reason. Okay, I love hunting birds over water. Now you gotta be careful and diligent with your roosts, right? Where are they sleeping? You don't wanna blow them off that roost. If, if, if they are sleeping on this body of water in the morning and that's where they're going back there to loaf in the afternoon because it's the only water, I, I'm not hunting it. All right, what is up everybody? I'm back on with Chad Belding from The Fowl Life today. Now, I'm saying I'm back on because we just previously recorded a podcast on kind of holiday goose recipes. Now, part of the process of one of the recipes that Chad uh, talked about, which basically left me super hungry, was uh, reverse searing. So we're kind of reverse searing the podcast here because this podcast that we're recording right now is going to come out the day before that one does. So we're going to kind of tease that uh, that that goose cooking recipe podcast now, but we're going to talk about, or but what we're going to talk about now is how the heck do you get those geese in the first place? So we're going to talk about some goose tactics here, some some advanced goose tactics. You know, Chad, we're kind of at the, the beginning of November here. The season's been going for a little bit, you know, maybe you need to pull out a few more tricks. I don't know. You're, you're the pro here. So um, yeah, man, let's, uh, let's talk geese. What's what's going on with the geese? Like, what types of things can a should a person like, uh, you know, be doing maybe this time of year when it's a little bit tougher? Yeah, I th- you know, being up there in Wisconsin, I've heard from a few folks lately, Mark, that that it has gotten tougher. You know, you're 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 always at the mercy of the migration, in my opinion. Um, when are the new birds going to get there? Right, because they're going to get there. I was out scouting yesterday, and I'm obviously not in Wisconsin. But I was talking to my daughter about just what you're, what we're getting ready to discuss here. Things to look for when new birds get to the area. Now there is there is this mindset of like, well, other birds from around the area might have found new water. But more than likely, when you see when you see a bunch of geese accumulated in an area that you didn't see there in July, August, September, those are going to be what we call migratory birds. There are going to be a local population of birds that you might see at the parks on local golf courses, on local parts of the river. But you, it is when you start to uh, get into this game more and more and scout more and more and figure out your scouting techniques, um, you're going to be able to say those are new birds. So the first thing that I would talk to the listeners about is what, how does weather play a role in this? How does the moon phase play a role in this? How does wind play a role in this? The barometric pressure, the storms up above us, you know, uh, waterfowl hunters will really start to become, I guess, kind of armchair meteorologists. And I don't know if there is a such thing, Mark, because I believe that all meteorologists are armchair meteorologists. <laughs> it's kind of just a guessing game. But I guess with today's technology and the Doppler radar and stuff like this, that that a lot of these weather reports can tend to be dead on. So if you start to see things like a full moon coming and you're going to see north winds coming and you're going to see a snowstorm up above you, then you can be rest assured that birds are going to be moving. If there's birds that can move with a wind, if they can get that moonlight to see a lot easier, and, and then of course during the day when it's cold, you're going to be able to hear them or see them. But waterfowl hunters are going to be coming to when new birds are in the area. So really key in on that. Where are new birds going to accumulate once they start getting to your area? And that goes back to what you mentioned before, Mark, is do you know the lay of the land? Are you using apps? Are you using land maps? Are you knocking on doors? Are you networking during the summer? All of the success that's going to come in September, October, November, December, January, and some of these states in Canada goose season even go into February, um, do you have a network built have you been to the local bake sales did you go to the county fair did you go to the farmers to the local high school basketball gym and watch the farmer's daughter play the farmer's son play the farmer's nephew sit down with that family have a cup of coffee at the local cafe a a lot of this has to do with your ability to negotiate like we touched on yesterday and network so it's all this preseason work that not only goes into your duck boat or your duck dog or your or your goose flagging or your or your concealment and your blinds and everything that you're going to be using during the season, but have you built your network locally? I would say that 90% of the waterfowl hunters in the continental United States hunt locally. 
I think 10% of them probably travel. They'll go to Canada in September. They might take one trip during the season. It may or may not be with an outfitter. So if it's not with an outfitter, you're going to have to do your homework on the same kind of tactic once you get to the new area. So my first thing, Mark, would be look for new birds and understand where those new birds are going to go once they get there. Do you know where the ponds are? How deep are those ponds? Will they freeze with the first hard freeze and, you know, when it gets below 32 degrees? Where are the river systems? Where are the oxbows? Where are the sandbars on that river system? Where are the new birds going to accumulate at? And then I'm going to train myself to always be taking my route to work or my route home or my lunch hour, and I'm going to be keying in on those areas of new birds getting to the area. I'm going to carry my vortex binoculars, a tripod, my vortex spotting scope. I'm going to be able to look at these 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 places or destinations, if you will, from a distance away so I don't have to waste my time driving in there every time. I'm going to have vantage points that I found in the off season. I'm going to be able to get up to them and I'm going to be able to scout areas where I know new birds are going to come because they're going to come to the water. They're going to live on water. They're going to find open water to stay in your area. So know where your open water is and know where the farmer's land is, his ponds, his open water, his or her land, you know, the layout of the land. But do all of that preseason. Have a game plan going into the big game like every college football coach does and know that i got to be knocking on doors. i got to be getting to know people around this area. And then all of a sudden you're going to get phone calls from these farmers. Hey, Mark. I want to let you know, man, I heard geese all night last night, and I hear them this morning. I think they're stacked up on the north end of the river. Go check that out. You know, you got, we got that blind out there, but if, you're, if, you, if you need to, you're more welcome to put your panel blinds or your ground blinds out in the beans. Boom, you're going to start developing that network. So my, my big thing is it, when the going gets tough, the good goose hunters are going to have a play because of all that work and networking they did in the off season. It's kind of funny. We're talking about, uh, you know, kind of like late season, you know, goose tactics or, you know, maybe advanced goose tactics. And your number one tactic took place well before the late season. You know, a lot of a lot of pre-work there, a lot of pre-work and season work, like you said, networking and finding places. And and uh, and I mean, yeah, it's like you can be the best goose caller in the world, I imagine. Right. Like and I'm sure you've got some great calling tips. Right. But if you don't have birds to hunt and a place to hunt them you're out of luck that's it 100 percent, 100 percent. it's you know in today's age of technology again with these apps and your ability to go onto an app and know who the landowner is know what the boundaries are know what's public know what's private and then all of these apps for the weather you can predict the weather yourself you can look at it and have a pretty good where you don't have to stay up till remember back in the day you had to stay up till 11 o'clock and then at the you know at the midpoint of that news report, you got the meteorologist coming on there. Now, <laughs> I guess that was for poor kids like me, Mark, that didn't have the weather channel on the cable <laughs> package. We had the you know we had the two, four, six, and eight or whatever the stations were. But in today's age, you don't have any excuse not to know when the migration is going to happen. You're not going to have any excuse to know the wind the wind phase, the I mean, the moon phase, what the wind's going to be doing, what the pressure's going to be doing, what the temperatures are. When you start to key in on that, like there's a guy out there named Tony Vandemore that owns a place called Habitat Flats, and man, he's awesome at this. To sit down and talk to this man about being an armchair meteorologist and to know when those new birds are coming because he's watching. You know, by this time of the year, you're watching Southern Alberta, North Dakota, South Dakota. Western Minnesota, you're watching all these different areas because he's wanting those birds to get down to Missouri. You know, so he's really watching that I-29 corridor and that Mississippi River flyway. And he's depicting like, all right, this is what's going to get these birds to move. To get these new mallards or these new geese in this area, I'm going to need to watch for this. And boom, he starts watching for it. And then he can say, all right, today's going to be a day. You're going to this place. You're going to this location. And you're going to this location. All three of our guides are taking groups out here because Tony knows with this weather, and the history, because he's got record books, he charts. A lot of people say that guys don't journal. <laughs> yeah, we do. Now, we might not go in there and get in our feelings a lot, but we journal. So if you think about the art of journaling or scrapbooking back in the day, apply that to your goose hunting tactics. Phil Robertson told me a long time ago that he's got years and years of all 60 days of the Louisiana duck season. Wow. Because it, And he's watching it. On December 1st, 1979, we had a north wind at 14 miles an hour with clear skies moving. And then he compares it to 80, 81, 82, and then all the way up to current days. And he just keeps watching the trends. He's all about, a lot of goose and duck hunters are all about trends. So, <clears throat> excuse me, Mark, but 
So really, really tie in to advantages. Why not take advantage of things that we have at our fingertips? People say, well, the golden era of goose hunting was in the 50s when the skies were black. There's more Canada geese in the flyways now than ever. Um, what about the technology we have today? What about the clothing and the warmth and the, the dryness and keeping the wind off us, being able to stay comfortable and dry and healthy and being able to stay in the field longer? You deer hunters have to sit in stands for hours. You got you to gotta stay warm. And right now we're living in an era to where we can layer. We have all this technology that these mountain climbers have been using for years to climb Everest and everything. And now it's all applied to deer hunting, uh, duck hunting, turkey hunting, whatever. We can move better. We can, we can stay warmer. We can keep the sweat off of us. It's a lot of breathable materials. Keep the wind off us. Keep the rain off of us. And boom, once you, you know, get past the elements and you can stay out there longer, now you're like, all right, I have a better chance of, of having a more successful hunt. So I think we're living in the golden age right now. So tie in to all those advantages that we have. Yeah, when you're, like, when you're out scouting, let's say, <clears throat> you know, maybe you're you know, putting on some miles. Maybe you don't have permission on a, on a piece. And hey man, at least from what I can tell, and this is kind of from the outside in, I'm not a giant, you know, big time waterfowler, right? But man, the guys that are with it, it's like a full time job. I mean, they are putting on the miles, they're burning fuel, they're scouting, they're knocking on doors. Like, what's that? What's that look like? I mean, I even by my house, like, it's pretty competitive. I feel because like not that far out of town, there's some there's some fields, you know, and there's um. There's a, a lake close by, so there's that water that you're talking about, right? So, you know, the birds are coming off the lake. They fly over my house all the time. I dream about shooting them, but I can't because we're in a neighborhood. But not that far from there. Um, last season, case in point, I drove by a field and I dropped a pin on some birds. I was like, gosh, you know, I need to find out whose field that is. Or, I, you know, I had the name, but I didn't have their phone number, you know. And, uh, and then I did a loop that night because I – done whatever I'd done throughout the day, didn't, didn't do the work and try and call anybody. And there was, I mean, there was, there were guys that were picking up deeks and they'd hunted, they'd hunted that field that night. So I saw those birds there in the morning, that field was being hunted by that night, you know? So what, like, what's, what's a good approach to, to get that permission? Is it just knock on the door and, and see, you know, just ask, I guess, is it, is it just as simple as that? You can, but, um, you just said that like your your aspirations were to hunt that field or maybe you're thinking about man it'd be awesome and boom all of a sudden somebody's in there well more than likely the people that were in there yeah probably knew that landowner through networking and i think and they might have been a family friend it might have been his nephew out there hunting it's hard to assume but man i've, I've made so many contacts by being present um and i think that if you get out there and you show people that you really care that you're not just knocking on that door when the geese are there. Yeah. That, that goes a long ways. And I learned that in Canada probably 20 years ago, 2001, that those farmers want to talk. Those farmers want to, they want to communicate. They want to have a kinship. They want to have a cup of coffee. They might want to have a highball at five o'clock after they get off of their tractor. Um, so I think that it goes way back to what we talked about 10 minutes ago about Man, be present yeah. during those local, the 4th of July celebration or the high school basketball game or the local rodeo or the fair, the carnival. Um, there's something to be said about that local mentality of, of staying local and, and, and being present and involved in the community. And then you can be that guy. That, I'm going to just bring this guy up again, Joel Cleefish. I mean, he works in politics. His wife ran for, you know, she was trying to become the Republican governor, get the nod, which we all know how that went, the state of Wisconsin. And um, he has built a network in that area that blows my mind. So when he, when he knows that new birds are coming to the area, he's either on it and he knows they're there or he's getting calls because he was so present when, whether he was, you know, whether he was out campaigning or whether he was on the, whether he was on a lobbyist deal to where he had to go meet with a bunch of farmers to talk about some conservation efforts or whatever, he was making friends. He was talking to him, shaking hands, showing that farmer, that community, that Joel cared. It's not just, hey, 
hey, I saw these geese coming over. Hey, man, I'd love to let you hunt, but I was Joel was Joel was out here this summer, and he was helping me mend fences, and he was helping me make sure that my cattle were all good. He was helping me bell all this hay. He was driving the grain truck for me. I can't say no to Joel, and that's what happens is that the people that are present and show up more than just that initial knock on the door when the geese are there, they're going to be the ones that are getting the calls, hey, the geese are here. You need to get out and call them, and then all of a sudden, they're out there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon setting up decoys for a 4 o'clock flight. That might be a little premature. 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and bam, they got their limits of Wisconsin honkers mm -hmm. because of all of the dil you know the due diligence they did in the offseason. Yeah, for sure. I mean, now, that's, not to say, that's not to say, Mark, sorry to interrupt you, that they saw the birds knocked on the door and a nice lady said, oh, yeah, go ahead and hunt them. But, man, it, it, more than likely they had a network and they knew that those people from, from prior conversation. Yeah, I think I think you nailed it. I and I'd about guarantee that that's actually what happened. And and it, in some ways, this dovetails right into what we talked about a lot as far as you know relationships and things like that. There are relationships that you gain gen, and I'm I'm talking about genuine relationships, not just a permission relationship, but a genuine relationship that you would only gain because of hunting because it forced you to knock on that door in the summer to have that conversation you know like you said at the ball game local ball game or whatever like that so you know and chad so this is the podcast that we recorded well i think it's going to be a podcast it's at least it's what we talked about when we were supposed to be talking about what we're talking about right now and then we talked for like an hour on you know just some really cool stuff and part of that was the relationships and it kind of goes back to like it's like oh yeah i knocked on this farmer's door in the summertime and like you said yeah you had a drink after work and now you've met somebody that is probably a really good person, an interesting person, has an amazing story. They become a friend. And you just, you know, it's like, yeah, you got permission to hunt birds, but you also got a lot more out of it, too. So I don't want to digress Big back time. into that because we got that whole podcast essentially talking about things like that. But um, it just kind of like brought it all together for me mentally. So you're talking about water, Chad. Like, yeah, you got to have the water, got to have the water, got to have, you know, the food. Are you ever, and maybe this is, you know, like a preference thing, but are you ever hunting birds on water when it gets late when, you know, like maybe, uh, maybe so, well, some water's locked up, but you have open water or is that just strictly like roost stuff for you and you're going to hunt birds in fields? When it gets late and you have the, uh, you know, you have the ability to hunt the freeze, you know, like a lot of duck hunters use this term hunt the thaw where once it starts to get cold, you know, waterfowl hunting has the word water in it for a reason. Okay. I love hunting birds over water. Now, you got to be careful and diligent with your roosts, right? Where are they sleeping? You don't want to blow them off that roost. If, if, if they are sleeping on this body of water in the morning and that's where they're going back there to loaf in the afternoon because it's the only water, I, I'm not hunting it. Now, if it's the last day or two of the season, yeah, let's get into them. It's, it's, let's celebrate. It's the end of the season. You're going to celebrate, then you're going to cry because you know you don't get to do it for several months. So, yeah, um, you know, you got to know, like, the difference between a roost where they're sleeping, the big water way out in the middle. Are they out on a big lake to where it's 30, 40 feet deep and it's not going to freeze tight so they can get out there and stay? Ducks and geese like to be on big water. Why? Because it gives them the ability to not to have foxes and, 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 and coyotes run through and smoke them during the night, right? So um, they're – when the open water is found, what is that open water? Is it a river to where they're going to be sleeping on that part of the river? And then they might go to a, what we call a loaf in the afternoon. And that's where as a goose hunter, you start to say, okay, in the, in the, er, in the late season, we have the ability to keep water open. Now, now check your local state regulations and the laws with your local DNR and your local department of wildlife and understand, can you use ice cedars? Can you keep the water open? Can you run an ice eater during the actual hunt? Is it considered a decoy mover? It's got a generator attached to it with an extension cord. And it, what it does is it aerates that water and it keeps pumping water through to where it'll either open up some ice, give it some time, or it'll keep a water open and keep it from freezing as long as you have your uh, alarm clock set and you're, got, and you're watching it all night and you're making sure that it never runs out of fuel, which is a big mistake that a lot of us make. That's why a lot of these ice eaters are wired in, you know, to – to electricity or they're put onto a big 50 gallon drum of gas that's gravity fed or whatever. So a lot of different ways around that part of it. But yeah, I love to hunt water. There's nothing more special to me than taking a boat full of floater decoys with a boat blind or just if you're getting out of the boat, that's fine. But uh, a, a boat ride with goose floaters in it 
and being able to set up for geese or a river hunt where you pull up and you're walking goose floaters down and there's a sandbar out in the middle and you got floaters out in the water and you got your full bodies and your sleeper full bodies with their head back turned under their wing and they're sleeping a realistic goose spread. When they come over those trees or over that oxbow, they look down, they're like, oh, it's on. Now, again, you got to understand what a roost is and what a loaf is because if it's if it's November right now and you still have 30, 40 days of the season, I don't want to kill them where they sleep. I don't kill a turkey in a tree. I don't shoot a pheasant on the ground. I don't shoot animals, you know, where they sleep a lot of time. You just don't do that really. So it, it, I'm not saying that you can't hunt a roost, but you have to be dang careful that that's not where all of your geese are sleeping because you're going to scare them out of there if they can't be secure in their in their in their home or in their bed so just understand that there are day loafs to where geese will they'll, they'll sleep here and then they'll fly five miles to hit this cornfield and then instead of flying the five miles back to where they slept they found a little local area right now it might be a little cattle pond and if that cattle pond's frozen get it open because if they fly over that deal in the sunshine after they got a full belly and a full goal of corn and they hear your calling and they look down and see that reflection of the water and those white butts of your decoys bouncing up and down in the wind and the current of the water you're pulling your jerk string the ice eater's going it's got a hole open you got full bodies around the edge of that ice it's absolutely death on Canada geese they can't resist it I don't care how old they are I don't care how smart they are they cannot resist an ice hole open with an ice eater on a sunny day with good calling and full bodies around the spread some sleeper shells maybe on the ice they've laid down they're taking a nap and then floaters for the birds that just landed to show activity some flagging you got a pit blind built into the embankment you got a panel blind up there you got your ground blinds all weeded in with a false line of vegetation on the edge of the water absolute magnet for a Canada goose you know what I'm not gonna say the word but it, uh, it's it's the word that goes with like Valentine's Day starts with an M. <laughs> it, it, can, it, can be, it can be really, really bad for Canada geese if you find that day loaf and you can open up that water. Colorado, Mark, the 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 the, the front range of Colorado, the gravel pits up there, there's a lot of man made gravel pits and they're deep. Mm -hmm. And I never seen any I never you get those lessers balled up, you get them coming off a of feed. Right? Now you gotta be careful though. Like are you gonna hunt water on a day that it snows? Heck no. If it's going to snow and you know there's going to be accumulation of snow in the field, those geese will stay in that field pretty 99% of the time they're going to stay in that field all day. They're eating some corn, they're eating snow, and they're using that to get the corn down and digest it. Mallards are the same way. So you, you, if you hunt water on a snow day, you might sit there for a long time. You might get a couple whacks at them, but it's going to be a slow go. But be, just make sure you know the difference between a roost and a loaf and understand the difference in, 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 in hunting those two areas and be strategic with it. Try not to shoot them where they sleep. Are, are there some ways or what, what could be some ways that a person like identifies that difference? They're like, well, I found a bunch of birds on water. Is that, is that just time of day? Like, well, these birds weren't here at X time, but now they're here at X time. So yeah, this is a loaf or like what things are you using to, to, to determine that? just what you just said like if you go in there if you go in there at 11 o'clock on a, on, a, on a day in november and, and you know they've already got full bellies you know they went out at seven in the morning it's mild weather you know the colder it gets the longer it's going to take them to get off of their loaf right they're going to sleep as long as they can and reserve as many calories and as much energy as they can because they have just spent all night sitting there reserving their body heat trying not to burn a calorie trying to stay still sleeping with their heads back and when the sun comes up they're going to let that sun do what the sun does they're going to let it energize the earth warm up the earth a goose can't just fly into a frozen cornfield and have a good meal that's like you going to get a tv dinner and then just <laughs> eating it right out of the you know mark borman grabs a hot pocket right out of the freezer you're going to look kind of funny eating that deal right yeah you, you got to let that microwave do what a microwave does so the sun's going to get up and warm the earth it's going to melt that dew it's going to melt that frost it's going to get some of that ice off of the food making it more enjoyable edible digestible for these birds so they're going to stay on that ice a lot longer when it's colder on a mild weather day they're going to come out they're going to get a full belly of they're going to or food and then they're going to go back probably around nine o'clock nine thirty ten o'clock and they're going to find water so if you're driving around and all of a sudden you see a bunch of can of geese and it happens all the time you're like oh wow they're in that pond but I drove by that pond last night at six o'clock when the sun was going down and there wasn't a bird on it. That's what they're doing. They cut themselves off of not, they don't want to take all of that food they just ate. 
and then use a bunch of energy to fly five or six, seven miles back to the open water where they slept, when they can just sit here for a couple hours, get the sun on them, get a little bit of a nap, burn those calories off, flap their wings a little bit, have a couple conversations, you know, do defecate on the guy's uh, grass or whatever and, and irritate people. And then all of a sudden they're like, we're right here. We only got a half a mile to fly to our food. We're genius. We're genius. Now we're going to go eat. And now we're going to take that long ride back to go to go get on that big open water because we don't want anything to happen. We got to be out there at nighttime. They don't want to be on this little pond where they're susceptible to, to danger when it's nighttime. And again, every condition is going to call for different, but do exactly what you did. Know where the water is. Know when the geese are around it. Well, they weren't there last night. I scouted this pond last night. There's nothing on it. Start scouting for roofs. Start scouting for loaves. And then go in there in the, in the morning and, or in the, you know, let the, let the, you know, you don't have to be out there dark to hunt a loaf. You can go out there at seven o'clock or so, take your time, set up a masterpiece of a spread and a hide. And I'm telling you, man, there's, there's some of the best Canada goose hunting happens on a day loaf with a sunny sky. I could, I, I'd love to show you video of it, but man, they're just, when they see that water and hear that call and that reflection, it just does something to them. It's almost like they just can't resist it. It's, it's a magnet to them. And it's one of my favorite hunts. I like it. Well, speaking of, uh, you know, you've talked a little bit about decoy spreads here. Um, and maybe, you know, if you have a couple examples or, you know, rules of thumb, right. And, and, and maybe sometimes rules are meant to be broken or it's just situational, you know, how many, how many birds or what style of birds, but when the, when the going gets tough, um, or, you know, maybe not even when the going gets tough, but like, what, what are your decoy strategies, um, maybe more this time of year versus earlier, you know, for like a field and a water situation. And maybe it just depends on the field, depends on the water. I don't know. But do you have some like kind of rules of thumb? Or are you just like, no, if I've got, if I've got 500 decoys, I'm putting out 500 decoys. Or are you like, nope, sometimes 12 is good. Yeah, I, I think, again, this goes back to the ability to adapt and change. And decoy spread, or first off, it's fun, right? It's so fun to figure out this game. And we're notorious as waterfowl hunters for being, one, we're gear nuts. We probably have way more decoys than we need. And two, we play mind tricks on ourselves all the time. Oh, my gosh, that first group didn't do it. We got to move the decoy spread. You go out there and you extend that line, make a J hook over here, make a W. Man, be patient. First off, I could say is that if your decoy spread doesn't work for the first flock and you're hunting that early morning, let the light come up. Let light get on them. Let the, the, the earth get vibrant. Like I said, let the sun do what the sun's going to do. Let the color get on them. Everything's different with color on them. Everything, the shadows, the sheen, the realism, just the brightness, it, it, it makes for a more realistic picture to those birds. So don't freak out if they don't do it first thing. But to answer your question, Mark, that the decoy game is weird because a lot of people be like, okay, well, I went over there and I, I, I was scouting for the early season and I saw 50 birds go into this field. Well, it's early season. So my mind tells me, I'm not going to do anything different than what these birds have been accustomed to since maybe August 1st when they started flying into this area. So I'm not going to go in there with 10 dozen decoys and freak them out. Like, you might kill them. Who knows? But why do it? Why, why show them the ace up your sleeve and put all of your spread out there, your entire arsenal, right from the get-go, when these local birds have been going in there going, hey, there's Patty, there's Charlie, there's, yeah, we've been hanging out with these dudes. Come over here. They're, you know, they're, 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 they're accustomed to going in there and seeing a small group of birds. So go in there and emulate that. But you got to start thinking about, all right, well, the temperature is going to be pretty warm today in September. I'm going to spread them out. There's no reason for them to be really tight right now. The food source is vast. The weather's warm. They're going to be spread out. They're going to be pretty much lounging. It's like a beach day for those geese, right? They're just going to go in there, lounge, pick at the earth a little bit. And then as the season starts to mature, you can start to say, all right, my arsenal, I have this in it you got to keep in mind, what do you have? Are you adding to it every year? And that's the goal of a goose hunter is like, all right, well, I got, I'm gonna, I want to get up to 12 dozen full bodies. I want to get up to eight to 10 dozen silhouettes. I want to have a two to three dozen sp uh, spread um, for my floater spread. And you start to think like, I can use all of these on a floater hunt. If I'm on water, I can put all these together to look bigger. My whole goal in decoy in my entire hunting career was always to make less look bigger and you can do that by spreading them out and putting them in strategic patterns where you know you hear all of the the ones like i mentioned the j hook and all that 
Get strategic. Use family groups. Break them up. Go put three of them 60 yards away from your keel hole. Show those geese the activity with your flag and your calling. They're going to hunt that sound up, first of all. But the flagging is going to be key to get their attention when they're way out there. Flagging is decoying, right? You get their attention when you get the, their way out there. But that's not all flagging is useful. As they start to approach that field and they get within 500 yards, I might not be picking it up and running through the decoys like I was when they were a half mile away. But now I'm back towards my blind. I'm on a knee. I'm lifting it up. I'm bringing it down. And I'm shaking it while I'm doing it. So it looks like back flapping wings. So then I'm, pick, I'm putting it in my left hand. And I'm doing it over here. Okay, so the activities right here, these geese are landing here. Why are the geese landing there? And why are there three out there and there's four out there? Well, those three, they, they just did something on their own because they didn't know where the food was. It's all this activity, all these geese landing right here are coming here because this is where the food is. Those three out there out of luck, they were there last night, but that part of the field got eaten out. That's done. All the food's off it. The grain's gone. So now here's where the activity is. We found the new pattern of food where the combine dropped a few or whatever the case is. Bam, do that. So you don't, you might not have to have 144 decoys out there. You might have, you might have 40 out there, but spread them out, get bigger, get longer, go wider. Everybody's scared of going bigger with less because they're like, well, that's going to give them more of the ability to land out there. Use your talents in flagging and calling and communicating and what's the word? Negotiating with those geese of, no, this is where you're going to want to be. Because if I get some geese at 70, and I'm not saying that big geese aren't going to shortstop you once in a while or whatever, but if you can get proficient on your call and use your flagging, you're going to be able to draw them into that 30 yards or closer mark of what we all want as a duck or a goose hunter, back flapping in that area. I, I think some of the toughest hunts in decoying birds are those second, third, and fourth days of the early season, you know? You start to get those birds that have been there for a minute, and you're not getting pushes of new birds consistently with the cold weather up north. They get smart fast. They might not even give you the time of day on opening day. A lot of times they'll come in there, and they'll come off the roost, and they're just like, oh, just glide in. We're just going to land about 60 yards outside the spread, and it's frustrating as heck. I've seen a lot in those early season greenfield hunts, and you got your decoys and you fire. You, you can kill them, and you get them a lot. Don't get me wrong. But a lot of times, that second and third day, fourth day of that early season, you're just like, man, they got smart fast, right? So don't show them everything at the beginning. Kind of grow with them. And if you don't have a budget to have a huge decoy spread, don't freak out. Just because Charlie down the road's got way more decoys than you because his dad donated them to him or whatever the case is, or he's sponsored and he's got all these decals on his trailer, don't freak out. Go bigger with less and become a better caller. Become a more proficient flagger. Make sure that your hide is better. Don't take any of that for granted. And you're going to trick geese as, as long as you do all of those steps that we've talked about with your networking, you're talking with the farmers, you know where the roosts are, you know where the loaves are. You're becoming smarter. There's a reason why Nick Saban's won so many college championships. Maybe he's just a smart coach. We've never, he gets good players, but he's a smart person. That's what the goose hunter that's smart and, and, and really preseason preps and strategizes and has a playbook and has a journal and has all these notes. Well, that's too much work. That's you're taking it way too serious. You're taking the fun out of it. No, I'm not. This is fun to me. This is a <laughs> game. I, this is my game. This is my life. This is what I want to be good at. I'm going to do all of this to be the best I can be at it. So yeah, man, just, you don't have to have a huge decoy spread, but now let's just move on real quick before we end this segment of what if you do have a big decoy spread? Well, heck yeah. I'm going to be able to use that if I'm hunting a migrator day and I go and I know they're going to be coming out of the north and it's going to be sunshine. I want a big spread. I want to look active. I want to be hammering at them with my call. I want a nice footprint on the ground. I want to I want a, a, a footprint that says, hey, this is where the activity is. This is where the action is. If I have the ability to have a big decoy spread, now I'm going to learn how to manage that and strategize with a big decoy spread. If it's cold, they're all going to be tighter. If it's warm, I'm not going to use all of them, and I'm going to spread them out more. If it's if it's a if it's a cornfield hunt, and I know that there's that, that the corn stubble's a little bit taller, I'm going to use a bunch of the heads up, and I'm going to show those birds that there are birds walking around those activity, and then right around my pit line or my blinds, I'm going to have all of my feeder decoys head down because that's where the activity is. They're feeding, so start thinking about why are these decoys made in different positions. One's a walker, one's an upright alert, one's a sentry with a real high neck, one's a head down walking feeder. Uh, there's all of these different postures for a reason. 
Paint your masterpiece. You have a blank canvas. Start throwing your oils at it and be Bob Ross of the goose world and put a nice little decoy here and a nice little decoy here. And then if it doesn't work, change it up the next hunt. Just keep adapting, taking notes, and become a better coach or a better manager of that hunt every day. Man, I really liked a lot of that, Chad. And, and you know, one thing I really liked, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of like a, uh, I would consider myself like a hunting generalist. You know, I do, I do a lot of different types of hunting okay, right? Like, I don't specialize um, in any one thing. And so, like, when I think about, like, oh, it's like, yeah, I'd love to really get into goose hunting more. Um, but, you know, it's like, oh, man, I, you know, I'm, I'm probably not going to get the trailer. I'm not going to get a second house so to have you know, to house my decoy. So to hear you say like, no, man, just be smart with you know a, a spread that might be a little bit more sparing, um, and make it look bigger, and then paint that picture with the activity. Like you know, I mean, and that that, that was the thing that really hit home with me that you were talking about. I was like, hey, this is where the party's at. Like, yeah, we got a, we got some other stuff going on here, but if you want to go to the party. It's right here. It's right here, right by me. You know, and I, I like that. And I think that, you know, you bring up a great point there. Watch live birds. You can't be lazy, man. You have to do the work. You have, It's like a bank account. You you don't get to go take money out of an account if, if you don't put anything into it. So you have to be active. You have to be present. You were present in the off season with the, the landowners. You're present during the season with the local cafes and learning. Now you're present watching the weather and your apps and you're making all that happen. And now I'm present with the live birds. I'm watching them. I'm listening to them. I'm keying in. Well, where's the action? Wait, there's a, there's a, there's 12 birds over there. Yeah. But look at all the birds going. That's where the action is over there. Those birds found the buffet. They found the, 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 the holy, you know, the, whatever I'm trying to say of like, this is where the food is. This is where the action is. The Holy grail is what I was trying to say. And now you you key in on that, that birds, are being active. That's where that gang fight is taking place right there. They're like, they, they heard that smack talking on the ground. These birds on the ground are going, this is where the food is. You all try to come in here. We're going to smack you. We found it first. Get out of here. We're here for a reason. Well, those birds in the air hearing that going, why are we going to go over here with these 12 when all the food's over there? We're going to go fight these guys over here and take their food. Again, whether it's wrong or right, it's the picture that I want to paint. It's my hunt, and I'm not talking about me specifically, personally. I'm saying it's my, it's your hunt. Do what you want with it. Have what's going on with that team, you know. And I'm sure that this is another strategy we're going to get into. But you got to, you got to know your role. Everybody knows their seat on the bus. Not everybody's going to be a decoy or putter outer, as I call them. Not every, so everybody's like, oh man, I don't want to do blinds. You got to take pride in your hide. If you get picked that day that you're on blinds, be the best blinder. Uh, hider that you can be going to get truckloads as long as you have permission from the landowner can i cut some of this stuff out of your ditch mr rogers yes you can boom boom you're cutting it out of the ditch you got a saw you know you got a chainsaw out there or you got one of those you know those little gardening um, um saws and boom, 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 you're, you're loading up the back of your utv or your truck bed more is better bring more get it all in those stubbles put it in between the blinds Spread some out around the blinds. Make it thicker after the last blinds on each edge. Make that false line look legit and natural. Have heads up decoys behind the blinds. So when the birds go out in front of you, they look back, they still see activity. When they go behind you, they look out here, they see activity with your flag and plus decoys. Nothing is being hidden from them. If you're using silhouettes, understand the angles of the silhouettes and how they're going to match in with your full body. So every time that goose or those geese move their heads, they're seeing realism. You can't put all your silhouettes walking in a straight line because what when they get to one side or the other of them, they're going to lose that effect. Okay, Silhouettes, when you get over the top of them, lose their effect. But if they're mixed in with full bodies or a bunch of other silhouettes you know, positioned with the right angles, they don't lose their effect because those geese are always picking them up with their peripheral and with their direct vision that that's, they look realistic. So you got to think about what kind of picture you're trying to paint. And it's a strategy. A lot of people think, I got a decoy, I got some decoys, I got a call, and I got a pretty good dog, I'm going to go kill it. And that's a great mentality. But you're going to see, you're going to start to get challenged. You're going to really start to get challenged by these birds. And if you want to be good for a long time during, you know, it's through, I mean, throughout that season as it progresses, you're going to get challenged and you're going to have to adapt. And you're going to have to become better. Wow, I'm not killing them every day. I don't even know where they're at. I don't know the lay of this land very good. I got, I got to get more decoys. I got to become better on my calling. 
maybe I should try that flagging thing. I didn't think that flagging was worth it, but man, Jeff, Jerry down the road has been flagging for years and he's got, I've seen his pictures at the local sportsman store a bunch lately. He's getting them. So there's all this stuff that goes on. You're going to have to keep improving. It's not easy. Now, I always use the term mark or well, a monkey can kill a goose. That's just because there's all this work is being done. You know, if you're doing the work, killing a goose isn't the hardest thing in the world. Now, you're not, you don't have to walk 14,000 feet up to get a doll sheep. It's not like strenuous on you. I, you do want to be in shape doing it, but it's not the hardest thing in the world to shoot at a goose and kill it as long as all of these pieces are in place and you've done your homework. I don't want to shoot one at 70 yards flying over the decoys, Mark Borman. I don't want to kill one out there 80 yards going left to right. My gun's not suited for that. I'm not a good enough shot for that. And I sure as heck don't need the food that bad. We can go to the grocery store if we need to. I want to decoy them and get intimate with them, kill eight of them at a time, high five with my buddies, celebrate in the hunt, and then go cook them. So there's just a bunch of different mentalities, but you will be challenged and you are going to have to improve every day. You're talking about those silhouettes. <clears throat> like, are there, you know, we're talking about decoy spreads and size. Like, what are some good ways, like, to you're like ah you know maybe i don't have a big garage or whatever but like silhouettes or socks or things like that is that are those good ways to i guess like save space but make your spread look a lot bigger yeah 100 percent. now look there's been silhouettes around for three decades four decades um and then they went they went obsolete for a while and they've made a comeback in the last couple of years and there's some manufacturers out there that got some really good looking silhouettes and i'm not a name dropper but you know our brand greenhead gear if you look at our new speckle belly and can of goose silhouettes they are dead on and they and i've hunted over them a bunch this year already and they perform but i would be lying to you mark if i said i think the best spread if you want to save room and save money is having all silhouettes mm -hmm. now socks yeah if you're snow goose hunting and you know you're gonna have a wind and you got to have numbers to kill migrators in snow goose season in the spring or even in the fall in canada you got to have big numbers so socks work and they'll and they'll fill that white hole in i still mix them with full body i think the best snow goose feel is full bodies hands down i yeah. would i would i would take 1200 full bodies over anything any day of the week but it's harder to move it's harder to pick up it's harder to be mobile all of that so i would be lying to you mark if i said Oh yeah, go get yourself 15 dozen silhouettes. It's, it's more, it's inexpensive. Get the bags; they're easy to carry. They're way easier to store. Your trailer's going to be immaculate because you're not going to have all these full body bags everywhere tripping over them every time you step. But my favorite spread is full bodies. I think that if you're going to hunt Canada geese in a dry field situation or in a water situation where you mix your full bodies on the sandbar, on the shoreline, your floaters are in the water, all of that, I think that there's nothing. You can never persuade me that silhouettes will outperform a full body. A full body is a goose. A full body yeah. with today's motion systems that we have on these full bodies with these stands and their ability to move and waddle like geese. Geese waddle. Geese just move like this. They move back and forth. The flag's showing their wings coming out and doing this. Um, when geese are coming into the area, they're looking down. They're seeing that waddle. They're always moving. It's very seldom, unless they're sleeping, that a goose stands in one area and just sits there and pecks. He takes a step, she takes a step, they're moving, they're walking. So those new decoys with the motion systems are, again, we're living in the golden age of technology. Yep. We've mastered, we, what we've done is we've bred a smarter goose. They're, they're seeing things that they're not used to seeing. They're seeing realism every day. Silhouettes mixed in with full bodies, I think are awesome. So if you can get six dozen full bodies and then and then just add on and, you know, align it with maybe four to 10 dozen silhouettes, you can start using that in your favor. But again, there's an art to silhouette hunting. You can't just go out there and put them out and think, oh, these geese, the, I, I think Canada geese are going to figure out silhouettes. Now I'm talking the big Canada geese. Lessers, they get pretty wild. They'll get pretty Western in a hurry as long as you sound, sound loud and you can hammer on them and you have a bunch of decoys out there. But I think that big geese are going to figure out your all silhouette spreads a lot faster than you give them credit for. And that's when you're going to say, I have to get into the full body market. Full bodies do take up more room. Full bodies are more expensive. Full bodies do have to have more maintenance. They demand more maintenance on them. You know, you got to make sure that the heads stay on. You know, a lot of people are screwing on the heads. A lot of these decoys today are coming with the tail loops, the, the, the parachute cord tail loops already on them to where you could carry 15 in each hand now with your fingers and they're so light and then you go around and pick up the stands more expensive 
but the investment is worth it. I think that the best decoy spread hands down for Canada geese in a dry field situation are full bodies. You're talking about hide considerations, and I really liked what you were saying there, or at least, at least it made a lot of sense to me of hiding those, you know, those hard edges. Um, so if you were, like, let's say you were maybe in more of a water situation, you're like, yep, I think there's a loaf here, like there's a sandbar. Um, you know, maybe maybe I've, there's a situation where you see birds, you know, I mean, they're on the sandbar. I mean, do you go hunt that, do you create a hide on that sandbar in the middle of the river? Or are you going to hunt the edges or a backwater or not a backwater, but like, you know, like a, a cove where you think the birds might want to land? Like, where are you going to set up on, on in a river situation like that where you've got birds on the river? Some are probably out in the middle just doing their thing. Some are on the sandbars, you know. Um, I've just seen a few situations like that, and I'm like, oh, how would how would I want to do it here? You know, what's the right approach? I love getting out in the middle. I love being able to get on a sandbar and hide. Uh, it's going to take some more because a lot of times those flat those sandbars are in those situations are going to be flat. They're going to not have a whole lot of vegetation. I mean, obviously, if we get lucky and they're out on a sandbar and it's got vegetations and overhanging branches, and you find one of those situations, good God! But when the river's up and there's a there's some of that sandbar. Um, you know, showing, you got to start thinking now, all right, what is the investment of my time on this hunt? Do I have the time? Am I agile enough? Do I have the equipment to access this river? How deep is it? What is the current? Is it boatable? Can I drive my four-wheeler out there? How do I access that river? Am I getting on through private property? Do I have permission to access that river? Am I entering from a a, a public boat ramp and boating down there and getting on there? And then once I'm there, through my scouting, because this goes back to scouting, of knowing that sandbar is there and the geese are all over it, can I hide on it? Well, heck yeah, you can. You can create a false line that wasn't there the day before, and you put your decoys all over that sandbar. Floaters out in the water, and then decoys, and then obviously you're judging your wind and figuring out where what angle these birds are going to approach from. But a ground blind hunt on a sandbar, even a panel blind hunt, if you can create the false line again, this is investment, bud. This is work. You got to put in time the night before and get your panel blinds ready. You got to make sure you get there early enough in the in the morning. Are they sleeping there? Are you going to go in there in the dark and bump them out of there? I don't like that. A lot of people go, oh, they'll come back, man. I've seen it so many times where they're like, you scared the living heck out of me today. I ain't coming back. If it's cold and you're going in on a river hunt and the water's moving and that's the water that the geese are using, I'm going to go in there a little later. I'm going to let them have get time to wake up, stretch their wings, not going to freak them out with a bunch of big dudes drinking coffee and chewing Copenhagen and go, hey, man, and scare them all out of there. I'm going to let them get out of there naturally, go in there, because they're going to take their time feeding that day. It's cold. There's no snow on the ground, so we're hunting the water. It's cold. They're letting the earth warm up. They're going to go out and get a full belly, and I think they're going to come back here because all these cattle ponds around here and these what would be day loaves would be, would be frozen up right now. So if I am going to hunt this quote unquote roost, then you got to make that decision. Like they slept here, I'm going in there, or they're using this as their day loaf and they're sleeping out on the big water. Then that's even the better. You found them in the middle of the day. You're like, that's where they're going after they eat. They're sleeping out on, on McConaughey, but they're, they're, they're roosting right here on this sandbar. Heck yeah. I am going to get out on that sandbar. Now, if it's too deep and I can't walk out there and get my gear out there, if I don't have a boat, if I don't have permission to go out there and I can get on the shoreline, I'm going to do my best to take some of my decoys and, and, and get them out there in the water with the current and get them swimming. And then I'm going to put the activity all over the shoreline with full bodies. And I'm going to do my best to emulate something that the action has moved over here. That's a really tough hunt though, man. When you have that sandbar and they have the ability to be out in the middle where it's safer, there's no boogeyman, no coyotes lurking in the bushes around them. It's a, it, it, it's, it can become a tough hunt. If you can get to that sandbar, Again, man, you get out there and you can have some vegetation around you and you get lucky enough to have a good hide. It can be unbelievable if you can make it happen. I like it. What about, uh, let's finish up. Uh, everybody likes calling. I like calling. I'm not good at calling. Uh, I like watching you call. What um, <laughs> What are some things like, is, is, is more or less, is less more? You know, again, a lot of situational stuff here, but you know, kind of what's what? What are what are some of your thoughts on that? Mark, how would you define 
my podcast style as a guest? Is is less more? Is more less? Do I talk too much? Are you looking at Ryan over there going, dude, my ears are about to start bleeding? How do you define that, first of all, Mark? You're pretty – it's it's really – it's a struggle. It's kind of a struggle fest to get you going, Chad. It really is. <laughs> so, just really, just really got to pull it out of you. So take that and – Put it into a goose call. Okay, I'm just go- we're on Canada geese here. I'm not I'm not even gonna go into ducks because I love duck calling too. Um I don't know if there's anything more powerful in hunting than the communication with wild animals. I don't know if there's now being a great bow shot and sending one is awesome. But to hear a good elk caller bugle up a rutting bull, oh man. I, I just love hearing them bugle and the, seeing the steam come out of their mouth and cow calling and bugling back and coyote calling and, 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 and howling and vocalizations that coyotes make and challenge barks and challenge howls. And, and, and without just a dying rabbit sound, that's an awesome one. I love to get intimate with these animals, turkeys, turkey calling, duck calling, Canada goose. The vocabulary, the jargon, if you will, of a Canada goose is so freaking diverse. It is so... Um, hard to master ducks they got they they sound like they they got very few words that they say geese they are like i hate for lack of better terms they're like an auctioneer with all of these words they can just talk and they don't quit sometimes geese get quiet but even at night when they're sleeping i don't know i don't know if this sounds all right on here you tell me mark but just shake your head if it's okay. Oh, yeah. That's good. So, um... Yeah, that's good. You have, that's a short read style call, and your grip, your tongue, your fatty tissues, your your vocal cords, your diaphragm, your lungs. We're working this unit, and I think that if you get to the point to where you can do it with confidence, and there's there's you know flute calls out there, there's short read calls in New York in the off season, in the in the preseason, these molt migrators, not preseason, but early season in September, you can use electronic calls. I've never done that for Canada geese, done it for snow geese in the spring. But I don't know if there's anything better in life than tricking Canada geese through vocabulary and negotiating with them, manipulating them, making them do the, what you want them to do through sound and talking smack in that gang fight and becoming goosey, becoming authentic becoming sacred like we talked about in our discussion yesterday like i i hold that conversation with canada geese sacred so yes my question my answer mark is if i sound like geese and i can read geese i'm not going to shut up i'm going to manhandle them i'm going to have the confidence like they are going to do every single freak it's almost like i have a training collar on them i'm training a dog they are going to do every single thing that i tell them to do now that doesn't mean they are but that's my mentality I'm not going to go into the hunt saying, I'm the best goose call in the world. You put your goose calls away. I got this, guys. Look at all my bands. I've been, I've been doing this for a minute, okay? I got this. No. Have fun with it. But practice. Become so proficient with your vocabulary and your jargon, your approach, your delivery, your, the, way that you, the, the way that you pronounce your words, the way that you can show your excitement, the way that you can show your relaxation, the way that you can, you can show that, hey, I'm eating. Oh, and now I'm swallowing. Oh, and now I'm trying to tell you that you're cute. Oh, and now I'm trying to tell you that I'm going to knock you out if you come in here. Like, learn all of these vocabularies and start to, to come up with your own of like, all right, here's my vocabulary. I can get high. I can get low. I can get loud. I can get soft. I can murmur. I can cluck. I can double cluck. I can spit note. I can spit moan. I can spit cluck. I can do all of these things. And then all of a sudden you're like, wow, that's what geese do. What? 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 So now I sound like one goose. Closed hands. All I got to do is drop my drop this hand a little bit and open this hand a little bit. Just with a tiny movement of my hands, I got two completely different geese. And if you can train your mind of like, well, now 
Let's do that for a week and let's add on a third one. And now I got three geese. And now you pick it up and you're like, all right, well, now I'm going to drop my jaw. Now I got a cluck moan or a moan cluck. They're way out there. You're going to get their attention. So you start to control the way that you, you and I have a conversation, what we talked about yesterday, conversing, authenticity, negotiation from across the table. You can read me, Mark. You can tell I'm excited right now. You're like, oh, I ain't going to shut chat up now. But if I'm sitting like this, yeah, Mark, you know, yeah, yeah, Vortex is okay. Yeah, 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 it's been an okay morning. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're not going to want to talk to me. You're going to be like, dude, no. So, like, I want to be that guy that those geese out there are like, man, that's, I, I don't have any other choice but to go over there and freaking talk smack to this dude. Listen to it. That's real geese. Mm -hmm. you got to become real. You just have to. You have to practice. You have to master this. We owe it to the birds to master this art. I don't want to cripple a bird at 80 yards because I couldn't call good enough to get him in. You don't have to shoot that bird. Wait until the next one's come off and try again. It's not, it's not about that picture at the end. It's not about having a pile of geese just because you shot him, shot him at 80 yards. It's about that experience, that conversation, that negotiation, the way it makes you feel inside of, oh, my gosh. They're listening to me. Oh, my gosh. They're smack talking me back. Here they come, guys. Get ready. Get ready. And bam, it's like, I don't know if you have a, a I don't know if you've watched the latest video that we posted, Mark, if you can, for 10 seconds on Instagram. It's the one we posted yesterday on the Foul Life TV. That is a live clip from a New York goose blind. And you can see the excitement on my face. This is being filmed in real time um, as the geese are coming out of Ottawa. They're a mile high, um, and they're migrators. Uh, and, and I'm telling the guys, guys, they're migrators. Get on them, get on them, get on them. You can hear the excitement. And we just hammer at them, hammer. And my cameraman's on me, and I'm calling as loud as I can with my guys. And boom, all of a sudden, I said, slowly turn the camera, slowly turn the camera. Here they go, here they go. And my cameraman goes out, and they're out of focus because he was focused on me close up. And now he focuses, reestablishes his focus, and bam, just cupped up. And you're just go ahead, watch it. You see it? I'm on. I'm on it right now. Oh dear. I mean, perfect. <laughs> Perfection, man. That's so cool. I love it. Yeah, you know, you, you've mentioned you know kind of that gang fight thing, and that's something that we talked kind of a little bit more about. Yes, you know, the other day, uh, yesterday. Yeah, it was yesterday. Um, like. And that was like a good mindset shift or at least something to think about for me where like you always think like oh, I'm trying to call this thing in like come on in come on in come on in like I'm trying to call you in which I guess yeah you are but what you were talking about was like no stay out of you know like almost like go away this is my turf I'm aggressive my food my food you get the hell out of here and which in the, ends up you know doing the reverse in a way at least that's that's kind of what I inferred from what you were talking about. I think it's, it's, it's okay, first off, it's to each their own. Like, I don't want somebody at Vortex, uh, the family that listens to your podcast, going, that's, that's crazy talk. Like, this is, again, my mentality is make it your own. So when I'm calling geese, I am visualizing a gang fight. I am not visualizing, hey, y'all, how you doing? Oh, yeah, it's, it's pretty good down here. There's, yeah, corn's, yeah, it's fresh. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's like Orville Redenbacher. It's not like that. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, I, this isn't, this isn't a, a this isn't a, a little, you know, fun having little uh, get together. This is some serious. We got to fend for ourselves kind of attitude. I just flew eight thousand miles. Like the migratory routes are long, man. They're long. I, 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 I'm tired. I'm hungry. Leave me the freak alone. I'll whip you if you try to come in here. I just work my butt off to find this corn. Now again, people be like, "Belding, you're out of your mind, nuts." Well, maybe, but I'm calling like you heard on that video. And I'm calling like you heard in the studio just now. Like I'm about to fight. I, I, I mentioned Mike Tyson and Rocky Marciano and coming out. When Mike Tyson would come out and stare down Michael Spinks in the middle of the ring and Mills Lane, the referees, looking back at Richard Steele, the referee and the opponent were staring as heck from Mike Tyson. They were done. The, the referee already knew what was getting ready to happen. The guy ringing the bell knew what was getting ready to happen. And Michael Spinks sure as heck knew he was getting ready to be knocked out in 91 seconds and outside of the ropes. That's what he knew was getting to go down. He didn't want to be in there with, the, with Iron Mike Tyson. That's my mentality in goose calling, that you don't want none of this. 
You don't want none of this. Trust me, you're going to get whipped, you're going to get worked, and then you're going to be in a crock pot. That's my whole mentality. It's, is it arrogant? No. I have so much compassion for those birds, but when I'm hunting, it's game on. I am smack talking those geese until they're going, I am going to whip you, Belding. I'm coming for you. And I'm like, no, you're not. Get them, boys. And then the next thing you know, they're, they're at 12 yards, and they're not feeling a thing, and they're feeding my family. That's the best feeling in the world that I didn't wing one. I didn't let, now, do cripples happen? Heck, yes, they do. I'd be ignorant to say they don't. But man, if you let them hunt you up, Mark, let them hunt you up. Let them do what geese are going to do. Okay? Let them do it. Read them. Picture your, your fight. Picture whatever you want to picture and go and talk and speak accordingly. That should be the theme of this, this segment. Speak accordingly. Jargon is the specialized vocabulary amongst a group of people. If you get into the cockpit of an airplane and you put the headphones on that you have right now, and you listen to that pilot talk to air traffic control, unless you're trained in aviation, you will not understand one word, let alone the whole conversation. If you go into a medical field and you're in a surgery room, you're not going to understand what that surgeon's saying. You go on a baseball field, you don't say, hey, dribble the ball over here and pass it to me. I'm going <laughs> to slam dunk it. There's a jargon of everything, okay? There's right. a jargon. Well, in waterfowl hunting, turkey hunting, coyote hunting, elk hunting, calling whitetail, calling dust, it's all different jargon. How special is that? How special is it that we have an opportunity in our short time on this, this earth with these trips around the sun? How special is it that we have an opportunity to learn how to speak all these languages? We can speak Italian. We can speak Spanish. I'd rather speak goose and duck <laughs> and elk. No, fan, I, I love speaking Italian. I try my best. Hey, what's going on? Huh? But I, can't, I, I, I go over to Italy and I, 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 I parlo Italiano, molto bene, mi amico, Mark. You know, I can speak a little Italian. Okay, but I had to practice Italian for a long time. You don't just go, I'm pretty smart at math. I can do social studies and I know a little bit about American history and then go, oh, I, you can't just go, I can speak Italian too. You got to be trained in it. It's the same with goose calling. You can't just pick it up and go, okay, I got this. I'm good to go. It's every single day. It's wearing your mom out. It's tick, tick, ticking your wife off to the point to where she calls a lawyer. Or you're getting your butt to the garage every night with soundproof walls, taking your truck. You know how many people have probably looked at me and thought I was had a, a drug pipe in my truck because <laughs> I got my goose call up to my mouth so much when they pull up to me at the stoplight? I'm hammering that thing. Windows up. Like, probably blowing my ears out. I practice, Mark. I practice. You have to practice that game fight, your conversation, what you're painting the picture of, the vocalization, the jargon, the authenticity, the intimacy of conversation with wild animals it's my favorite absolute i love my dogs i love my hunting buddies my hunting partners i love duck camp and goose camp and turkey camp i love the fire i love the taste of billy bogey smothered deer steak but i love the conversation the intimacy of talking to animals and if i did not have that mark if i did not have this right here what i call my rope got my dog whistle on it but other than that you got a speckle belly call you got a short read can and a goose call and then i have three single read duck calls on there just for different 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 volumes and stuff i didn't have this i ain't going yeah. if you said chad come hunt with me but you can't bring your calls i'm probably going to go hunting somewhere else and bring my calls yeah but it's just me i love to call yeah love to talk it's well the best and you talk a lot about putting um emotion in your call right like you know that emotion that emotion well what's what has more emotion than when you're about to get in a fight when are you the most amped up when do you when you know what i mean like um i can't think of a time like you know at least you know for a human being when you're like like in some ways like more emotional you know as far as like you know when you're like in conflict mode right so it makes sense that almost by like by default, for by taking that approach, you are going to impart more emotion into that calling. I think you're dead on. I think that when you're at that that point of you know that that confrontation, that what we called yesterday in the Shakespearean play, that climax, like you know it's getting ready to go down. You know, people get emotional on that. They get you know when you're talking emotional with somebody about something you really believe in. It's all. It's never really the part to where you're like. Yeah, the drive was pretty cool, and man, you know, the rain was hitting our windshield. But man, this freaking mountain lion ran across the road, and my kids went crazy. And like, you know, like it's it's always that part that gets you going. It's not 
the everyday stuff. It's like you got to find that spark. And geese are looking for that spark. They're listening for that sound. And when they hear it, they know it. They hunt you up. That's why I would put money on it that the guys and girls that are most successful in waterfowl hunting are legitimate callers and conversers and negotiators with the vocabulary and the jargon. And that's just the way it is. I mean, we you would not kill those geese right there that you just saw in that video. You would not kill them with just a decoy spread in a and a flute call going, ar, ar, ar. Now, you'll go kill some geese that year, but not those geese. Yeah. You're not getting those geese. Yeah. I promise you, you're not killing those geese with just going, ar. Now, that's a great starting point. And get on it. Practice. Keep practicing. Everybody needs to keep practicing. Nobody's the master of this. It's so fun to learn new notes. When I go to these calling contests, I, 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 I MC the World Goose Calling Championships in Easton, Maryland, and I see these 18, 25-year-old guys, Kyle Jones, get up there. Kelly Powers is there with his calls. He's not competing anymore. He's too good. They won't let him compete anymore. <laughs> but you hear these sounds, and you're like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I've lost a few steps. I better get with it. So now here I am texting people. What was that thing you did? you got to send me an audio clip of that. Hey, send me a sound file that I want to hear that again. And, and, then I, and then I sit there for hours trying to master that. So it's, no, it's, it's an ever-learning process, and it's so fun and exciting to speak Canada geese. I love it. I love it, Chad. Well, man, uh, once again, I appreciate the time. Uh, lots of great nuggets of information in there. I, uh, I feel like I would hit the ground, you know, running pretty fast with a lot of information. So lots of good stuff in there, uh, you know, on, on everything from hides to setups to decoys, you know, water fields, scouting, pre-work. A lot of that pre-work. And like you said, I mean, one of these things, like, you know, oh, they're putting in the work on the calling, putting in the work on your scouting, putting in the work on your networking. Work, 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 right? There's the common thing, theme, like this is work, but it's also a labor of love. And if you work hard at it, you're going to get good at it, and you're going to you're gonna get those special moments when the birds work right, and, uh, and they, they do it, and, you know, you're off to, uh, off to cooking some delicious goose meat. So I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, man. I hope that... Uh I hope that some of the listeners get to take something out of it and just, just know that it's never ending. It's a, pro, it's a lifelong learning process, but it's so fun. And if, if we do it right and you take care of yourself, I think it's unbelievable that you can waterfowl hunt and hunt in this country every day and have the right to do it and the privilege. Until you're 80, 90, I, I mentioned John LaMonica yesterday, Mark, 93 years old. Come on, let's stay in shape. Let's try to stay as healthy as we can. And, you know, Lord willing, we all get to hunt together someday upstairs. But right now, let's all freaking do our best to be the best hunters we can for the next generations, mentor people, get new hunters involved every year. And yeah, and get, get, get to practice and wear your mom out. Go, get it, go, go in the garage and practice because your wife's tired of it. But get good. Become the best goose hunter you can. And it's just the memories and the stories. And, and it just, it's an amazing lifestyle. And I am so thankful and blessed to be a goose hunter. Awesome. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, like I said, tons of great stuff here that you can take to the blind, take to the bank, the proverbial bank, and then to the blind um, and become a better goose hunter. So thanks, everybody. Take care, and we'll see you out there. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.